Good evening, everyone. We want to welcome you to our Wednesday night Bible study here at Sinod Calvary Baptist Church on a Wednesday evening. Uh, we thank you for joining us, and we're going to go ahead and uh, jump right in and ask Brother Don to open us in a word of prayer, please, sir. Our Father, let us pray. Our Father, our Lord, our God, uh, we are eternally grateful in our hearts, Lord, for your kindness and your goodness towards us. Lord, you have saw it fit to send your servant, Reverend Chisholm, another week in order to um, bring to us your word, to bring clarity, understanding, so that we may not use the sword incorrectly, but be able to yield it and fight against the attack of the enemy properly. We thank you for him. Father, in your time, in accordance to your will. Touch a man's servant in every way that is needed, that he may continue to do not his life, but curtail his life to do your will and your bidding. Therefore, Father, nothing is impossible for you. So we bring this petition to your feet this afternoon. May your word go out and accomplish what it needs to do in the hearts and in the minds of those who will attend this study. May we not take you for granted, nor your man's servant. Strengthen him now. May he declare your word with boldness. and May the humility of the Spirit of God abide in him, through him, and with his speech. We thank you in advance for what we will receive this afternoon, because you are a giving God. Give unto us your word, Father for we desperately need it. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Yeah, Amen. Amen. Thank you, uh, Don. Uh, we're all um, home folk here. And um, one of the announcements I have is we have our Good Friday service, Friday, God willing, uh, 7 p.m. at church. We'll be live and live streaming as well. And then Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday, um, this coming Sunday, April 9th. We'll be meeting at our um, regular time. All right. And, uh, you know, I, I before we I turn it over to Reverend Chisholm, I know sometimes we look small here when, you know, we come together. It's usually only a few of us. But you go back and you check the uh, the views on the YouTube and people are actually watching the the recording. So, you know, it's 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 uh, it's really, really good that well, we do record them and be able to uh, put them up because not everybody can make it all the time. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Rev. Thank you, my brother. So we're looking this evening on 12 historical facts pertaining to the resurrection event, which relates to Jesus' life as a historical figure, his death as a real death, and his resurrection as a real historical event and its implications. So you can have this as a little slip away. The material is short, two pages. That I'll try to read as best I can, sight allowing, of course. So bear with me if I stumble. You understand why. So I'll read you through. Let me see if I can move this away. Get the marker there. Come on, thing work with me. All right, let me go to the top. This I collected and added my own to Gary Habermas's book. Let me go to the top so you can see. I give credit to him. A wonderful text for your library. 12 known historical facts concerning the resurrection event. And in brackets, Gary Habermas, the historical Jesus. Ancient evidence for the life of Christ. And it was 1996, all right. So, number one, Jesus died by crucifixion. Matthew 27, 50. Mark 15, 37, etc., etc. No, I would ask somebody just to read Matthew 27, 50. We are all familiar, or should be all familiar, with the text documenting the death of our Lord. Ma, 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 
Matthew 27, verse 50, please, somebody. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. All right. No interesting. Brother Don Sr. asked about Josephus. I completely forgot that he had uh, actually mentioned aspects of the resurrection or the death of Jesus. So Josephus, in addition to the Gospels, is another source. Remember, it was the first um, to sec early second century Jewish historian, not a Christian at all. In his Antiquities of the Jews, 8.3, written between AD 90 and 95. Uh, after AD 70, he became court historian for Emperor Vespasian because he predicted that Vespasian would have been the, the coming emperor. And so he did when he entered office because of Josephus' support, he made him court historian. Incidentally, the war between the Romans and the Jews, AD 66 through to 73 or 75, Josephus began fighting on the part of his Jewish brethren. But then, when he saw that his brethren were not gaining the upper hand, he turned coat and went on the side of the Romans, fighting against his own people. Turned coat, but he, he benefited from that move because the Romans won. The Holy Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed. And because he had prophesied or predicted that Vespasian would be the next emperor, he got a high-ranking court appointment as court hist historian for the emperor. In his um, Antiquities of the Jews, he, he, he documented this, quote, Pilate condemned him, that is Jesus, to be crucified and to die. So he mentioned that Jesus really did die as a, a follow-up of crucifixion under Pontius Pilate. Tacitus, one of the leading, still one of the most re recognized um, Roman historians of the first century in his annals at 15.44, written approximately, and that the see there is circa, approximately AD 115. He says, quote, Christus suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of Pontius Pilate. And the Talmud, a Jewish document at Sanhedrin 43a, says, quote, On the eve of the Passover, Yeshu, another version of Yeshua, was hanged, not by the neck, but put up on a cross. And that, that idea of hanging is used in Galatians and in Luke. So they are documenting the real death of Jesus. Number two, Jesus was buried, Matthew 27, 59 to 60, Mark 15, and the other references there. He was buried, real burial. Number three, Jesus was, uh, let me see if I'm having this right here, no. Jesus' death caused his disciples to despair and lose hope, believing that his life was ended. Matthew 28, 27, Mark 16, and Luke. They got very despondent, very, you know, depressed because their, their master, whom they thought would have lived forever, kind of a thing, or certainly for a longer time, was now dead. And you know, you know the words of the two on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24. We thought it was he that would deliver Israel. And, of, and moreover, they said afternoon of the Sunday, after the, the crucifixion, today is the third day since these things happened. Number four, the tomb was discovered to be empty just a few days later. Matthew 28, Luke 16, Mark 24. And here is a document that is very important. The Nazareth Decree, discovered in 1878 at Nazareth, written in Greek, believed to be issued by Claudius, who was emperor on the throne 
47 to 54 AD. He says, quote, it is my pleasure that graves and tombs remain perpetually undisturbed. If, however, anyone charges that another has either demolished them or has in any other way extracted the buried or has displaced the ceiling on other stones. In case of violation, it is my desire. And you know what the emperor says, it is my desire, it is virtually, it is my command or order that the offender be sentenced to capital punishment, end of quote. Number five, the disciples had, experience, had experiences which they believed were literal appearances of the risen Jesus. And the textual New Testament references are all there. Uh, six, because of these appearances, the ones doubting disciples became bold proclaimers of Jesus' death and resurrection. And you know that's the essential record in Acts of the Apostles, chapter, several chapters there, one and onward. Seven, the resurrection message was the center of preaching in the early church. The record is in Acts as well. And also, we have to, we'll reckon later with 1 Corinthians. Eight, the resurrection message was especially proclaimed in Jerusalem. Be that specially noted where Jesus died and was buried shortly before. And Tac Tacitus in his annals says, quote, at 1544, a most mischievous superstition thus checked for the moment again broke out not only in Judea, but even in Rome, end quote. Another prestigious Roman historian, Suetonius, in his book Nero, he wrote, I think, uh, volumes on each of the emperors that he experienced, says, quote, after the great fire at Rome, that is AD 64, punishment, 63 or 64, punishments were also inflicted on the Christians, a sect confessing a new and mischievous religious belief. He shares that opinion as with um, Tacitus. Nine, as a result of the resurrection message, the church was born and grew in Jerusalem. Very important, in Jerusalem where it all happened. And the references in the biblical text are there. 10, Sunday became the primary day of worship for the growing church. Sunday being the, res the day of the resurrection and the day on which Jesus made some post-mortem appearances and as well the day on which the church was born. And the texts are there. Here is now a non-Christian Roman judicial opinion from Pliny the Younger. There were two of them, Pliny the Elder. He died in a major earthquake and fire in the first century or second century. And this is Pliny the Younger. I think they were related. One was a relative of the other. He was governor of Bithynia in Asia Minor, now modern Turkey. In his letters, this is his judicial letters from court that he would send to the emperor when they were trying the Christians. Written about AD 107. He says, quote, the Christians were in the habit of meeting on a certain day before it, before it was light. Sunday is the day in question. When they sang a hymn to Christ as to a God, end quote. 
then 11, James, Jesus' brother, who had been, who had been a skeptic, was converted to the faith when he also believed he saw the resurrected Jesus. Mark 3, 31 and 235 and John 7. 12. A few years later, the Christian persecuting Paul or Saul was converted. And I think I told you that it is not true that Saul's name was changed to Paul after his conversion. Romans had several names and they can use either at will and others can use either of their names at will. That was a traditional custom. So Saul or Paul was converted by an experience which he believed to be an appearance of the resurrected Jesus. Acts 9, 3 to 6, 22, 6 to 10, and so on from the biblical record. So I wind off by saying any theory which seeks to counter or compete with the resurrection must deal with and fit these 12 facts. Fit them in terms of adequacy of fit and completeness of fit. You know, just fit a few and leave out some. You have to deal with all of these 12 historical facts. And these are facts that even uh, theologians and specialists in history who are not particularly evangelical in outlook or Christian in perspective agree these are not challengeable at all. They are irrefutable. There's a minimalist 12. There are others that could be added, but at the basic minimum, without contestation or refutation or, you know, coming against it, those 12 stand out. So I commend those. I will send this to Sister Natalie tomorrow. And so you will have that for your private study. Any, let me stop share and open for any questions, comment um, or observation. Well, I, I leave them up for the time being so that you might want to tell me to go back to a particular number because you may have a question or a comment or an observation on one of the numbers here. Anybody, anywhere. I'll also send a file, Damien, to you, and you can make it um, more accessible to the brethren because there are three, three, three tracks in a file called The Evidence for Jesus, and the presenter is my former philosophy professor at Biola University, the leading apologist in the world, even while Ravi was alive. He was superior to Ravi in terms of a Christian apologist in world ranking. Professor William Lane Craig of Biola University. I will send the evidence for Jesus. He, he argues he was doing a series in Jamaica and I recorded him at the Jamaica Baptist Union recording studio. Did a series of them and this one is part of the series, you know, uh, based on defending Christianity. So I'll send that as well so that you can have that for your private study. I and think we had, I things. think we had gone through that one. Um, I rather suspected, so you know, but I wasn't well, sure. One time you were either coming a little later, or or you you couldn't make it the day. Right. And I, I think had we had we had, listen, we had listened to. It. No, it's very good. Yeah, he's solid, solid. But it's useful for the brethren to have material in their own reservoir. So if you need it, you can pull up on it and share it with somebody else who is doubtful that Jesus actually existed. In fact, I have a little simple, maybe a simpleton approach to people who say Jesus never did exist. I just ask them, now tell me, if Jesus was a myth, how can you crucify a myth? Mm -hmm. How can you do that? It's just nonsense. There are Roman historians who documented that he was crucified by one of their officials, Pontius Pilate, while Tiberius was, was on the imperial throne. You can't crucify a myth. So if you can't do that, then you have to accept at least that he was a historical figure, not a myth. And you deal with the other things in your face, kind of a thing. Question, comment, observation, anybody? Uh, 
I like how you put the. I know you always mention Josephus, and you mentioned mentioned that was it Tacitus, Tacitus, and, and the principal chief Roman historian. Yeah, right, and then not, you know, not Christian at all. And you pull from the Sanhedrin, and yeah, that's a Talmud, you know, the Jewish collection, and and all that to show, like you said, it's 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 historical. It's not just yeah. it's not just coming from. The Bible, just the biblical source, source, you know, yeah. Which you know, like you said, people who would just be like, oh, you know, um, bias. Yeah, and what they do to Damien and the other brethren, they sometimes count the four gospels as one piece. No, each gospel had to apply its own trade in the first century. Here's a document written by Matthew, by Mark, by Luke, by John. There are four pieces of historical evidence. And you have to just deal with that, not just lock, suck, and barrel and say, because they're in the one New Testament, you count the whole New Testament as one piece of evidence. Not fear at all. Right. Right. And for those who don't know, if you claim, as some uh, non conservative theologians claim, that the Gospels were written too late to provide historical evidence of the life of Jesus and his death and resurrection, well, what do you do with? Alexander the Great, the two prestigious writers who wrote about him were 400 years later documenting his exploits. Arian, and I've forgotten the name of the other one. Plutarch, yeah, what's the other one? 400 years later, and yet no historian of Roman or Greek history would doubt the validity of the documents that they wrote concerning the exploits of, of uh, Alexander the Great. Yet you want to poo-poo documents which were written in the same century in which Jesus lived and died and rose again. Right. Give me a break. You're being uh, academically, intellectually unfair. And I think uh, unfair one time... Unfair or dishonest. <laughs> and dishonest, right. It, it, it can be both. <laughs> yeah. I think, it's, um, I think it's on here. I think you either you showed a piece or you referred to a piece that... Um, uh, Pastor Vody did, and and he went through it um, about the validity of of the Bible. Yes, right. Why and, I choose to believe the Bible? It's on YouTube. Right. Riveting and, material from a serious scholar. Yeah, and then just like you said about Alexander the Great, you know he, you know how people were saying, oh, the monks changed this and the yeah. monks did that, and and how. Everything, how it would have had to be, the, basically, the, the, sorry, the, the only word I can come up with is conspiracy. Oh, yeah. That would have had to have been in in motion for something like that to yeah. happen. They you know, could they, not change the manuscripts at will because we have manuscripts in several languages. And they are still available, those manuscripts, to show the, the similarity and sometimes the identical nature of those documents in terms of the first century happenings of the life and ministry of Jesus. So people just come up with theories and they, it's as if they think we are all fools. They don't mm -hmm. expect us to check the facts. And when you tell me that a manuscript, somebody changed the manuscript of the, 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 the early manuscript, show me a piece of evidence that from somewhere where the change has taken place. They shut up readily because they know they can't find it. Yeah. And then, you know, it's something like you, you, you know, you've mentioned here. So, and um, I'm sure in your, your travels and your the debates and stuff, the people just bring something up and because they've said it, they think it's canon or they think it's, it's, it's law. And nobody can. And, 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 and there's no, nothing to back it up. Yeah. Nothing is there. No. It's like, there's a British, a British scholar, John Allegro, I think his name was, some years ago, the man came up with that. I can't, I can't be kind. Uh, well, let me be kind here. <laughs> I, I wanted to use a word to describe him, but let's just call him a, an academic clown. Mm -hmm. That's the nicest I can come up with, the kindest. The man wrote a book, got a ba band of money because people would buy it quickly because he's a known scholar. Said that Jesus was a, a, a an hallucinogenic mushroom. Jesus didn't exist. He was just an hallucinogenic mushroom. Give me a break. What do you mean by that? So Jesus was a mushroom. 
Not one scrap of scholarly evidence to back the book. People went and bought it, wasted their money, and then the, the thunderbolt came down from British scholars who said, this is just nonsense. Nobody should check this book, check out this book, you know. They had to read it because they are scholars too. Uh, but we have gone through it. We cannot support this thesis at all. It's just asinine, I think, was uh, the, the adjective that somebody used of him. Crazy. Yeah. But he got the fame and the money already. Oh, yeah, got the money. He done pocket the money. Yeah. And then people realize, but hold on. This guy took me for a, gave me a six for a nine. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're come swindlers. On. They come up with, um, you know, controversial uh, sound bite kind of a things and expect to gain money from it. Uh, the major TV stations in America and elsewhere would pay them money to come on. When you hear their thesis, you say, no, hold on. This guy went to first class book, let alone have degrees and talking this kind of a crap. I guess but it's it like happens and it keeps happening. I guess it's like in in politics and I guess in some marriages, you know, people say the loudest voice win. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess, you know, these guys they come out with all this stuff and they keep saying it, keep saying it, keep saying it, keep saying it. Yeah. And then you have the one or two. Who, like you said, who who seem to be knowledgeable or educated, be like, huh, maybe. And then they will start repeating it. And then next thing you know, there's a class. Yeah. At two and three universities. And um, un uncritical readers will pick them up and parrot them in university lecture theaters and high school um, students pick them up too because they are teachers who are um, parroting these things that they have read without checking. They read the sources quoted by these people to see if they're right or wrong. I'm miserable with quotation because I, I'm going to check your sources. Your, did you read your source correctly? I've had to chide people who uh, quote a, a person who is writing in Greek. The person who is quoting the Greek uh, source does not read Greek well. Neither is the person who is parroting this, this um, person who is quoting the Greek. I've had the unpleasant task of saying, look, this author that you're quoting did not read the Greek properly or could not read Greek properly at all. So you can't take his argument from the Greek. I know Greek. I can read the Greek. I know the Greek is to be translated and he mistranslated the Greek either because he lacked the skill of reading Greek or he, he just saw somebody else who translated it that way and just picked it up willy-nilly. Somebody gave him a paraphrase. Yeah. He took it as gospel. Well, yeah, I think, I think like, like we started out, I think, you know, that this is not just from the Bible. This is historical stuff. And like you said, there's many other books and things from around that time or a little later that all refer to uh, Jesus in some kind of way. Yeah, and the book by Habermas is good because he, he goes to tons of non-biblical, extra-canonical historical material that supports the life and ministry of Jesus. A good book to have in your library. What's, what's the name of it again? Yeah. The Ancient Evidence for the Life of Christ. And what's his name? Habermas, H-A-B-E-R-M-A-S. Yeah. -E his name is in brackets just below the title when you get your handout. Habermas with a B? Habermas. Mass, okay. Yeah. Interestingly, Tangent, he had a, a series of debates with Anthony Flew, the British atheist, who eventually surrendered atheism. And I think Habermas has a, a lot to do with his change of mind. And so, having been an atheist for years, writing again, there is no God. His la last book was, There is a God. They cross out the not on the title. I thought it was cute. There is no God. They cross out the no and put there is a God. Hmm. I, 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 I ran and bought that as soon as it became available on Amazon. Yes, I think Brother Brown? I'm sorry. I think Brother Brown. You're, you're, mute, you're still muted, Brother Brown. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Hearing you. I'm being kicked out of the library, so I have to leave you guys. Oh, all right. right. <laughs> no sorry about that. Brother Brown. No problem. All right. <laughs> Maybe it's time for them to close up. Yeah, that's the time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. You say, brother, good to see you.
Anybody else a question, a comment, an observation? What you said the name of the book was on the author? Which which one? The, the one with Last the ancient one evidence. Mentioned. Ancient evidence is Habermas, ancient evidence for the life of Christ. And I'm sure you can find it on Amazon. Either Amazon or Christian publishers. So it's not the historical Jesus. Ancient evidence for the life of Christ. Okay. Life of Christ. I don't know why I wrote down that the historical Jesus. That's yeah. Habermas. Okay. Oh, you spell it? A B H A H A B E R M A S. H A B E R M A S. And you'll see it in the handout. Mm -hmm. Just below the heading. And also I would highly recommend Lee Strobel's book. The Case for Christ, there's a movie on it as well, and he's now updated and enlarged it. I got it the other edition, and I quickly bought the new edition. Excellently written because he's a prize winning journalist, and so he writes like a novelist, and the book is very, very good. There's a, there's a youth edition of it, which our young people would need to get copies of too, because they are facing these challenges in high school as well as in college and university. Maybe it would be a good idea to get the movie and show it sometime, maybe in parts, you know, either at Bible study or combined Sunday school one Sunday morning. I, I think getting that it would be a good idea showing it. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? No. Nope. All right. So God willing, we pick up on another piece next week. Yes. 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 No problem. All right. Blessing. Reverend Legister, you might close this out in a word of prayer, please, sir. Yes. Gracious, loving Father and our God, that we thank you for the privilege that is ours to delve into your word and uh, those who have been writing about it and saying what they're saying to clarify for us the truth about your life here, death and resurrection. And so we pray that you would help us to hold firmly to the facts that uh, we have and indeed to our faith in you, that you were indeed here that you suffered and died and rose again. We thank you for our teacher, Reverend Chisholm, and uh, we pray that, Lord, you would grant him his, his sight back fully so that he can continue the ministry that you have entrusted to him and that you would help him to uh, be restored fully if it is your will. Hear us, we pray. Forgive us of our sins, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Blessings, brethren. All right, everyone. And uh, we'll see you guys on Friday, God willing. All right. So, Don, okay. that is Have a good one. 7 o'clock? Okay. Yes, yeah, 7, 7 p.m. Friday, God willing. Yes. All right. All right. Recording stuff.